Good morning, my name is Kate, I'm from Macquarie University and I'm going to talk to you this morning about some of my underwater adventures that I've been lucky enough to have while I've been at this university. So, on the PowerPoint presentation you can see two very, very cute fish. The one on the bottom is called a wobbegong shark and the other one with the colour around his eye is a blue groper. Now these two are my favourite fish ever because they're the ones I was lucky enough to do my PhD in. But if any of you have ever been to the coast, you know that we are lucky enough in Australia to have this beautiful coastline and to have this amazing water everywhere. And along each of these coasts are reefs. And reefs hold a very abundant life and some really weird and wonderful fish with it. So this is a, called a squid. You'll probably know it from eating it. It's what your calamari. Um, or maybe a very cute little seahorse. This is always a favour of some people's. You've got other ones like a box fish, very funny little face. Or some other ones that live just along the reef. And the blue groper again, like I said, my favourite. You'll hear a lot about them today. Some ones that just come in from the tropics during the summer, all the way down from Queensland. Some other beautiful ones that live along our coastline and only found along our coastline, like the weedy sea dragon. And then I just had to put this in because it was kind of a little bit funny. But some really cute little stingrays as well. That, that isn't my photo, I would have liked for it to be. So, one word that a lot of people think when they talk about the ocean is sharks. And I bet you anything that when I say the word shark, how, hands up if this is the kind of image that comes into your guy's mind. Nope, no hands up. Okay, one or two. Maybe even worse, is, is this the kind of image that comes into your mind? Yep, a lot more. Or maybe this. But there's also a lot of other sharks in our oceans, and some very small ones and some very cute ones. And in actual fact, there are over 400 species of shark found in Australia. And only about five or six of those could be potentially dangerous to humans. That means less than 1%, so that's one out of 100, that could do you some harm. But because of the kind of things that we see in the media, and because of those images that I showed you before, these guys have got a really bad rap. But they're really important. And I'm just going to talk to you about what they do in the ocean this morning. And I'm going to use the wobbegong because that's what I studied and it's my favourite. So a wobbegong is what we call at the top of the food chain or near at the top. So a wobbegong will eat lots of different fish, sometimes some octopus, sometimes some other sharks, but it'll eat a whole range of different animals. And those animals in turn then also feed on a lot of other little animals. So from anything from little, tiny little zooplankton that kind of look like shrimp, only a lot, lot smaller, maybe some seagrass or some snails that live amongst that seagrass. Now, in a healthy ecosystem, you'll have a few sharks at the top, then you'll have more fish underneath them. Whatever they're feeding on, there will be a lot more in number. And then whatever those guys are feeding on will be even more in number. And this is what we, um, how the food pyramid starts to come about. So some of you guys might be familiar with a triangle like this, where at the bottom you've got your seagrass or your snails, and then whatever feeds on those. And as we go up, the number of animals decreases, but this isn't a healthy ecosystem. And this is how, and, and we need these predators in order for this ecosystem to be healthy. Because as soon as we take that shark out, then whatever they feed on grow in numbers. And then whatever they feed on start to disappear. And then that feeds back into those fish, into those secondary consumers. And they'll then decrease in numbers. And so the cycle goes on until we have nothing left. So I don't know about you, but I really like the ocean as it is. I like it being blue. I don't particularly want to go and have it all green and maybe just algae. 
But that's what will happen if we start to lose these sharks or these bigger fish. And it's not just sharks that um, have this kind of role, but I'll talk about that um, next. So you might be saying, well, wobbegongs are kind of cute, so who's going to be catching wobbegongs? Well, they're actually used as flake, and that's very popular in fish and ship shops. And so they've been commercially targeted in New South Wales since 1991. And between those years, more than 50%, that's half of the population, started to disappear. And these guys will grow very slowly. They don't have very many children. And so that puts them very vulnerable because the population can't replenish itself very quickly. But as I said, it's not just sharks that have this role. You have other predators as well. And this is the blue groper, my other favorite fish. So these guys can grow up to about a meter long. They live on the reefs and they're found only along the eastern coast of Australia, just as Wobbegong is as well. So it's really up to Australia to protect these. And it's a very important role that you guys are playing as well. By being here, you can then go out and tell your friends about this amazing animals that there are underwater. And like I said, blue groper have the same sort of role. So they'll eat sea urchins, which in turn then eat on the algae. And once you take those um, blue groper out, there's too many sea urchins. And I don't know about you, but I don't really fancy going swimming and just getting spines all in my feet. So what do we do to protect these big fish? Well, there's a few different techniques that we can use. Of course, we can stop catching them. We can reduce the amount that we catch them. But, I don't know about you, but I know a lot of people who like fish and chips. And I can't imagine everyone in the world just saying, okay, no more fish and chips. But what we can do is we can just say, during certain times of year, we won't catch these fish. And that's done for a lot of species. Another way that we can protect these fish is by having marine protected areas. So just as if you are imagining your local national park, somewhere you'll go bushwalking, somewhere a bit green, that also happens in the ocean. And we have these little pockets where we protect and where we will restrict the number of activities people are allowed to do. And one of these areas, which I'm sure everyone will know, is the Great Barrier Reef up in um, northern Queensland. And that's probably our largest and our most famous marine park. But we have them all over the country as well, as this diagram shows. And in New South Wales, we're also very lucky and we've got a whole load of these marine parks all down our coast. In around Sydney, though, we have much, not big marine parks like the um, Great Barrier Reef, but what we'll have is these smaller aquatic reserves. But one problem when you're working underwater is it's not always going to be a good swimming day. So how many of you guys, hands up if you can see the animal in that picture there? Cool. Well, a few of you have got a lot better eyes. Oh, most of you have got a lot better eyes than me then. But that can be an okay day to go working, but it gets worse. And a lot of fish don't do much during the day. They're nocturnal. So could you imagine swimming in the ocean at night? It's going to be very hard to learn about these animals. And we need to know what these animals do and what their life cycles are and what their habits are so that we know how best to protect them. And that's where my project comes in. So as I've told you, wobbegongs and blue gropers are threatened. Uh, wobbegongs have been fished and blue groper were also fished as well um, earlier this, or in the late 1990s. They were very good eating fish, so, and they became very um, depleted due to spear fishing. So they were protected as well. And in actual fact, they're the fish emblem for New South Wales. So I was asked, OK, Kate, how are we going to protect these two fish? And it's like, well, we really don't know that much about them. So we've got to learn about them first. And luckily, with the use of technology, we've got some amazing things that we can use nowadays. 
And one of the techniques, which is the one I used, is acoustic telemetry. And I'm sure you're going acoustic to what, what? So acoustic means sound, and telemetry just means a transmission of data by remote sources. So everyone has smartphones and iPads nowadays. Well, unfortunately, fish don't carry around smartphones, so we can't use any of that technology. Uh, but this technology is around the same, and it allows us to use sound waves in order to transmit data. And how does that work? Well, what we do is we get one of those little um, tags, which is shown in the palm of the hand there. And that's only about an inch long. And then we get the fish, uh, we just put them to sleep for a little bit, and then we put that transmitter into the belly of the fish. And that will stay there for the rest of the fish's life. And the battery on that will last for about five years. So every time that fish is around one of these, which is called a listening station, we can start to track those fish. So how does that work? Well, as I said, these sound waves are transmitted from the belly of the fish from that little transmitter. And each of those listening stations will hear around 200, 300 meters away. And as the fish passes those listening stations, those sound waves are picked up by those listening stations. And that will say, Bob was here on this day at this time. And then we can start to strategically place these listening stations in areas where we want to know. And I was asked to look in two particular areas, which was Cabbage Tree Bay in Manly, in Sydney, which is a very small little marine protected area. So what those on the um, picture on the bottom is the listening stations. And so we placed them all around so we could have here all over this area and we could tell when the fish were there. But you can do it other ways as well, and this is happening all over the country. You can start putting them down the coastline. So this was between Sydney Harbour and Botany Bay, which is the next bay south of Sydney. And we have these listening stations all down the coast. So any time any of these fish, or any other fish that have these transmitters in their bellies as well, any time they swim by, these listening stations will hear them. Oh, okay, so what's this really telling us? Well, you can also then start to put them in, like, place them around certain areas like we did in here. And this is a high concentration of receivers within a, the actual protected area. So the yellow hash shows the areas that are currently protected, but that's the rest of the reserve as well. And what we were asked was, do we need to make this area bigger? Or will these fish be okay? So once you get this, these listening stations back and you start to look at the data and, oh, okay, well, we kind of start to get an idea of what these fish are doing. So these are the wobbegongs over a two year period. And those listening stations were out every day for those two years. And what we can see is that some of the sharks, like they're a bit lazy, they don't want to move too far. They're not not, you know, going to go, they're going to stay where they are. And that is shown by those horizontal lines. So each of these lines shows a different shark. But some other sharks really didn't particularly like the area. They came, they were like, yeah, this isn't for me. And they left. And so then they're not there very long. And with these wobbegongs, what we found is that they're traveling all over the place. They'll be going up and down the coast. They'll be going 12 kilometers off the coastline and the only way that we're really going to be able to protect them is by reducing that fishing and by not by these marine protected areas whereas the blue groper they are a bit different and these guys were just lazy most of them just did not move at all and so you can start to use those marine protected areas to protect fish like blue groper but they're not going to do much for the wobbegongs but you can also do some really cool other stuff with this technology and you can start to see where each of these animals is going. And this is showing two different fish. Uh, the red and the blue is one fish and the purple and the darker blue um, is another fish. And we can start to overlay that on the reef, which is the brown parts. 
and look to see where they're going in these particular areas and we can really start to find out a lot of information about these guys. But, well, so what? What, what does this all mean? Well, marine biology is a very challenging um, career, but because we can't observe those animals, we can't go and swim with them and follow them all the time. So we have to use technology to start solving these problems. And the more we use technology, the bigger problems that we can start to solve. And we need these solutions to be able to conserve these species. And as I showed you, we need these species for the health of our oceans as well. And although sharks might be, get a bad rap in the media, sharks and all those other predators are, are needed. And we need them for our healthy ecosystem. And we need them so that next time you go swimming, you can enjoy the beach. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, so I've been all over Australia, um, swimming with lots of different sharks. Um, I went to South Australia and swam with the white sharks, those bigger, scarier ones. Um, and as I said, there's over 400 species of these guys all around Australia. So, yep, I've swum with the really big ones and I've swum with a lot of small ones as well. No, no, I haven't. Um, just like any animal, so if you went to Africa and you went to go and walk with lions, as long as you know what to do and you stay in far enough away, you can protect yourself. And so by just knowing what these animals are like and knowing how they're going to react to certain situations, you can make sure you don't get bitten. So no, I've never been bitten. No. Like I said, once you can start to see them in, your, in the way that they live and you start to see them, yeah, just swimming around, they're really peaceful. And although those teeth look really scary and I don't want to get too close to those teeth, um, yeah, it's, there's no real need to be afraid of them. Um, as a child, I really loved going swimming and I'm sure this movie is way too old for all of you guys, but I, my favorite movie when I was little was The Little Mermaid and I always wanted to be like The Little Mermaid and I used to spend hours and hours in the water. And as I grew up, that turned into going hours and hours of snorkeling and then as I got even older, I went diving and I started to see all these animals in their natural habitat and you start to appreciate how what I'm what I've just given talk to you about these healthy ecosystems how they really look and that just drove me to want to protect these and to teach people like you guys who we need yeah you guys need to understand this as well so that you can make sure that all the oceans remain healthy so that's what inspired me Yes, Wobbegongs, they, yeah, they'll be really, really close to shore. So if you were lucky enough to come to Sydney and you went down to a beach called Manly, um, you can go there and there's little reefs right by the beach. And Wobbegongs are found all along there. But they also do go really far out to sea and they can go down to 200 meters. And that's really far away. That would take a lot of time to swim. Um, but they're found all along these reefs and because of their coloration, uh, they blend in very well with the reef. And so they can go and hide and they can wait for fish to come along and they can eat those fish. Wow. 
Uh, we're very lucky that we're part of a very big network. So anybody in the country who has one of these listening stations out in the water have all said, every time one of your fish is heard on my listening station, I'll give you that data. So I've only got about 30 of these listening stations out in the water, but I'm very lucky that around New South Wales, there's a lot of other people who want to be doing this kind of work. So we have over 400 of these out and that's all up different river systems and it's all along the coastline. And then around Australia, I, you can almost map the coast of Australia with where these listening stations are. It's thousands of these guys are now out in the water. Yes, I was. Um, I, as I said, I absolutely loved swimming when I was a child, but it was a little bit scary when you go out one day and it's a hot, sticky day, but you really want to go for a nice long swim, but the water's really brown. Um, so just like everybody else, yes, I was scared of sharks. But then as I said, like when I started diving and I could see how important these guys are to us, um, it gave me respect for them and I stopped being afraid of them and just really started to fall in love with them. They're quite expensive. Um, they're about $1,000. And each of those little tags that we put in the animals is about $300. But once you have any of those listening stations, all you need to do is change the battery. And they'll last for a very, very long time. And so, although it might seem a lot of money at first, over the lifetime of these um, listening stations, they really start to pay for themselves. The biggest shark is actually called a whale shark, um, and they grow to about 15 meters long. That's really big. Even babies are about three meters long. Um, but these guys don't eat any fish. They eat plankton. So they'll eat tiny little microscopic animals that are swimming around, but uh, they'll swim all over the world and all over the oceans. Um, and we can see them in Australia, but only if you're really lucky and normally only on the West Coast. Well, there are a lot of theories, but no one knows for sure. So the way a lot of these sharks hunt, as I said, they start to become a lot more active at nights. Um, so great whites, they will start to hunt very early in the morning or very late at night because their main prey source, the main stuff they'll eat, um, such as seals, that's when the seals are returning, going to and from their hunting. So the great whites will then use that time of day because the seals can't see them very well. So when we start to jump in the water around that time and you might be sitting on the top with, you know, splashing around, you can start to look at a seal like a seal, but the sharks can't see very well, like very well either. And they're using a different sense and sharks have this wonderful sixth sense called a, like where it's using your electrical pulses and they have these special glands all along the front of their face that allows them to see like pulses um, or even your heartbeat will give out an electrical pulse. And so the sharks use those to hunt. So the theory is it's just really mistaken identity. They're not meaning to go and bite you. Um, but there are a lot of other theories around, but that's probably the, the most common one. That's really hard to say, actually, because for a lot of populations, we just don't know how many they are. So as I said, we're really only learning about a lot of these species now. And um, so, I would say as you go 
down that food chain, as you start to get towards the bottom of the pyramid, you'll have more sharks. But to be able to say which species out of that 400 that we found around Australia would be really difficult. But wobbegongs would probably be around about middle of that. The only real word I can think of is pretty magical. So these guys are really peaceful. Wobbegongs, they don't really do much. If you go swimming with them during the day, they'll really just go and sit on the reef. And as long as you don't go up and start harassing them, they won't do very much. But other shark species, such as reef sharks up in the Great Barrier Reef, they, they'll just come and check you out, see what you look like, and then they'll just swim off and keep going about their business. Um, but yeah, it's really magical. If your parents ever said yes, I would highly recommend just going and swimming with little sharks or even just going to an aquarium and starting to see them through the glass. And you can start to see just how amazing and wonderful they are. The biggest thing is to know, um, know that it's important. And so there's a lot of different threats to the marine um, ecosystem and marine pollution is a big one. So when people go to the beach and they just leave all their rubbish there, and that all then goes into the ocean and then gets eaten by all the different fish. So one thing that you can do to pledge to help the marine systems today is to just say, I'm never going to litter again. I'm always gonna put my rubbish in the bin so that it never ends up in the oceans. And that was something that can really help. Um, but the biggest thing is to learn more about it and then to tell your friends and your family and your parents. I was very lucky that um, I just asked for some people to volunteer and a lot of people put their hands up and said, yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, but there's a lot of other people at my university who do similar work. So we all helped each other out and means you learn along the way as well. But if you're ever interested um, when you're a bit older to go diving, um, there's always local clubs and stuff that you can join and then that's where a lot of researchers will also go and ask places like that to help them out as well. There's, ooh, that, that's a hard one. That's a really good question. That's a very hard one. I wouldn't be able to tell you all the endangered species because there's just so many. But around those reefs, you'll still get hundreds of sharks. And many of those sharks have been overfished um, or they, because of the damage to their habitat, they've got nowhere to live. And probably about a third of those sharks might be classed as vulnerable um, or all the way up to endangered. So in New South Wales, we've got a very special fish called the um, grainer shark and they're endangered as well. And there's only probably about a thousand left of the, those guys left along the east coast of Australia. There's a lot of ones that are born probably only about 10 centimeters long, and then they'll grow to about 50 or 60 centimeters long. And one of the ones that I really love is called a Port Jackson shark. And they're um, called Port Jackson because they're found in Sydney. These guys are pretty funny little things and they're quite, uh, they've got a lot of courage because they're only about 60 centimeters long. Sometimes they get up to about a meter. But if you're swimming around uh, and they're swimming around as well, they'll just swim straight into you. But don't worry, they don't have any teeth. Those guys just eat crabs and they just have these plates that they use to crush the crabs. Um, so if they swim into you, it's not a big deal, but um, that's probably the smallest one that we'll get around this coastline. Mm -hmm. 
sharks actually have a very long um, gestation time. So anyone who doesn't know what gestation time is, that's basically like how long the sharks are pregnant for. Um, but sharks aren't like humans where, where they all grow in the mum. Um, so sharks will sometimes lay eggs and then, or they might grow the same as us. Um, but the longest gestation, gestation time is about 11 months. Yes. Yes, it was so much fun and the greatest part was to be able to go and see them as well and to be able to meet other people who are doing work on other species and to travel around Australia and see it all. Um, so yes, I had a lot of fun and I'm still having a lot of fun now. So... Um, I'll just go back to the slide. So this little black thing on the palm of the hand in the top left hand corner, this is called the transmitter. Um, so what we'll do is we'll get a shark and we'll just put them to sleep. So just as if you went into hospital and you had to have an operation, you'd um, have some anesthetic. We give the shark some anesthetic and they go to sleep. And then this allows us to get this transmitter and to actually surgically implant it into the belly of the shark and sew him back up and let them recover. Um, so once they're in the belly of that shark, when it gives out that sound and when the, uh, the shark is back in the water, once they've recovered from their little operation, uh, that sound will then transmit through the ocean and hopefully to one of our listening stations. Thank you.